Amen. We're going to start with Isaiah chapter 6. Read a few verses there. Reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Amen. Would you put your Bibles down this morning and go to the Lord in prayer with me and ask him to anoint this word. God, we've come here to your house. Lord, many looking for a word, many looking for an answer to a situation. God, we've come here humbly enjoying your presence this morning. God, I ask that you minister to each and every person that's come into this place today. Touch their minds, touch their hearts. We worship you today. We thank you for your presence that's in this place. The presence that provides peace, that passes all understanding. We thank you and we give you all praise and glory. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Man, this morning I want to talk a little bit about the price of praise. The price of praise. And forgive me, I'm a little teared up. I feel his presence in this place today. You know, it's, it's incredible to be a voice that God is able to use. And, and it's such a privilege and an honor. And uh, it just... It's incredible. It, it uh, you know, when you receive a word from God, there's nothing like it. And then, as a church, to be able to have somebody like Pastor get up and be able to be that voice and speak into your life, and then you know that God knows your name and who you are and your situation, that's just a blessed thing to have happen in your life to have a pastor like our pastor. Amen. You know, God desires praise. That's what God desires. And we read in that scripture right there, it was a clear picture of angels that were worshiping him and somebody from earth calling out to him and crying unto him and he heard his voice. And something happens when the created being begins to worship. There's something unique that happens when holy, holy, holy is uttered from the mouth of a human being that has the will or, or the opportunity to say no. There is something in the scripture that was defined here that causes us to know that posts of doors were moved, things were moved, foundations of heaven actually shook. When worship from a created being begins to come out from a willful heart, a willful soul, something begins to happen in the, in the spiritual realm, in the physical realm, the atmosphere is immediately changed. When praise begins to come forth out of your mouth, John 4, 23 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. True worshipers, the scripture says, when you worship God in the truth of who he is, you no longer matter. Your situation no longer matters. Your problem no longer matters. Everything that you're struggling with no longer matters. When you worship him with truth of who he is and the God that he is and what he can do, all that seems to matter in your life begins to be put into a proper perspective of who we are in relation to who he is. The Father seeketh such to worship him. He is seeking those who are willingly giving praise and worship. We have a song that the angels don't have, and that's because we have an option. We have the ability to say no, and so we have a freedom of choice to worship God that the angels don't have. So our song, our praise, our testimony is quite unique in that we're not made. It, it's not something that is mandated and put up Upon us to worship so the worship that comes out of your mouth is exactly what sustains God in all of his glory 
It's the worship that you offer of our own free will. You see, he desires and values our praise so much. The price that he paid on the cross of Calvary was paid with a heart of willingness. It is a love that transcends our thought and, and ability to understand. It's a love that we'll never comprehend. And it was done willingly. That was the price that he paid for the praise that comes out of our mouth and the praise that he desires. But do our values and our desires today as humans and people who have a will that's set apart from that of the angels, do they align with God? Do our values and our desires align with God this morning? That is sort of the question that I'm going to pose to you throughout this sermon. And how important is God in your life? How important is God? We expect God to value our desires and to value our needs and to value our situation. We expect that from God because after all, he is a God of love and a God of mercy and that's just who he is. He is defined by the very word of love. So we expect certain things from God. But what value does your personal relationship with God have in your mind? What is the value that you place on your relationship with God? God. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, it's all about priorities. It's all about where your heart is. It, it's, it means that where your heart is, the basis, the very essence of your heart, the makeup of it controls your emotion. And so your passion for the things of God begin to be birthed out of a passion for God himself. And so therefore, out of your heart is birth praise and, and worship. And, and that is the very essence and being where all of this is birthed. Oh, yeah. Is the emotion of where your treasure and your passion is. And if it is truly in the house of God and for the things of God, then you will have no problem yeah. uttering forth the praise and worship of God. And then God begins to recognize those praises and worship. And then all of a sudden he begins to respond. What you place value on will determine where your, your passion is and your emotional energy will be focused in that spot. I heard a saying one time, I don't know who it's from or by, but it says your actions are speaking so loud that I cannot hear what you are saying. In other words, your actions speak louder than your words. Your actions speak louder. So what do you value? You know, it's pretty incredible. And a lot of what I'm getting ready to list here kind of defines of somebody that I used to be. I used to value value and cheapness and the ability to save a buck or two at maybe even the expense of somebody else. I valued things in my life that were not of God. And I think we've all been there because we're wrapped in flesh. And so our values, when we first start out in our walk with God, don't necessarily directly align with those of God because we've not yet taken the time to know him and to know his heart. But people get excited about cheapness or having to pay or not having to pay full price for something. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody brag about how they won the car salesman. They won the game. They're big on saving on clothing and electronics or sometimes you hear of people getting up at one two or two in the morning or maybe not even sleeping at all just so that they can make the sales on Black Friday <laughs> people value high salary jobs with little work 
They value certain things. People value leisure and comfort and sleep. They value these things. They value sleep sometimes over prayer. Sleep sometimes over church. They value certain things and when we value them, they become priority in our life. And sometimes they take precedence over things that should not be valued above. So our values, it becomes the position in which we live our life. When we value something so greatly, all else tends to sort of gray out and not become priority in our life. We come to a position in our life at some point where we start assigning values to certain things in our life. We start setting values in our thinking, in our, in our ideologies, and, and what we value in our family, and in politics, and, and how we value our job, and our cars, and there's certain things in our lives that we value that we ought not value, but by human flesh, it's just part of our nature. But when we walk into the presence of a living God and we walk into a house where worship and praise is the primary value, it is the primary function, everything seems to be in perspective. I don't know if you've noticed it, but a lot of times, sometimes you feel like it's hard to live for God. Have you ever been there? You, you feel like it's really hard and, and then all of a sudden you walk into church and then you, you walk into an atmosphere where it seems so simple. It seems so clear. It's just crystal clear that living for God means that it's just all about worship and praise and how simple is that? But the minute we walk out that door, the values of this world and what is being preached to us seem to water down our relationship with God. Anybody hearing me this morning? Anybody hearing? So our value system seems to change with our environment. So as we change our environment, which it may be friends, where it may be a job situation, whatever the case may be, our values sometimes change. That is why it's so important that when you come to church, your focus and your value system should be of such priority that when you walk out that door, when you walk out that door, the values that you establish in this building should go with you and should trump every single value this world has to offer. So we have a value system that we compute in our head. That's something that we immediately look at maybe a piece of clothing or maybe a car. And in our mind, we're thinking that's worth it. And then your hand automatically goes back to your pocket or to your purse. And you're, it's kind of like an automatic thing that happens, right? You've made that decision in your mind that what I'm looking at and what I want is of great value. In fact, it's of more value than the cash that sits in my bank. I'm just bringing it down to a real level here. Some people don't recognize high value because they're so used to the low-valued items. And I have a perfect illustration for that. Now, it may not directly apply to the adults in here, but let me give you an illustration of how once my wife was taken out to dinner with Brother James and Sister Arlene. And they wanted to take her to a nice meal. And she probably was, what, 10, 12 years old. Now, Brene would never make this mistake. But they wanted to take her to a nice meal, and so they decided they would take her to Black Angus, if I'm not mistaken. Northwoods Inn, even better. They decided to take her to a really nice steakhouse, and they paid all this money, had a great time. But it was the statement at the end that exposed the level of value that she had. And the statement was, it was good. Anytime you throw the word but into a sentence, that means that the first part of that sentence is irrelevant. <laughs> The food was good, the price was high, but I would have rather had McDonald's. 
I'm sure that they were thrilled about that statement. Some people don't recognize value because they're used to a certain level of value. In her case, it was because she was a little girl. But sometimes you run across adults that don't recognize the value of what church and what God has to offer. And you're offering them something and they're like, I don't need it. But don't you understand the value that comes along in the peace of mind that you cannot buy? There is a value in the family of God and in the church that transcends any family, whether it be bloodline or otherwise, it transcends any family, the value of the family of God. And so we make the decision of what it is that we're going to do based upon value, whether it be cheapness or whether it be very costly. You see, people don't realize that there is a cost to every decision made. There is a cost. Amen. There is a cost to every decision made. Now, you can buy furniture at Kmart. You can buy it at Ikea. You can buy furniture at a lot of different, different places, but when you buy it at places that are economical, that are dollar friendly, you know, it probably isn't going to last very long. I'm not saying that we all should go out and spend 20 grand on a bed set. But what I am saying is that when you set your value at a certain level, that's where you're at. That's where you're at. It's probably going to fall apart on you in the first year. And at the end of the day, or the end of the year rather, you're probably going to look back and realize, had I spent another hundred or two, I probably would have something of greater value. Had I not valued the savings so much as the benefit, had I not valued what I could do as to what I can't do, then maybe I can actually have a life that's worth living. Mm. You see, it's not rules, it's not regulations, but it's values. It's what you value that we preach here. Do you value a life of sanity? Do you value a life of completeness and wholeness with family? What do you value? Do you value the things of God that gives you benefits beyond what you're worthy of? What is it that you value? It's not what I can't do, it's what I can get to do. I get to have peace of mind. I get to have a relationship with God that I don't have to question tomorrow because tomorrow's already taken care of. I don't have to question where my paycheck's coming from. God already is there in tomorrow. That's the value of what I can do. You see, I can do a lot of things. I can destroy a lot of different things in my life based upon where I set my value. Anybody following me here this morning? It's all about where you set your value and what you value. I can smoke, I can drink, I can do drugs, I can steal, I can do a lot of different things, but that is not what I value, but the, the truth of the matter is, is yes, I have those choices and they're on the table. They're on the table. But what is it that I value greater than all of those other options? That is the question you need to ask yourself today. Is it what you value that you buy? And then where is your value set at? Where is it set at? You see, you can take shortcuts in life. You can take shortcuts and attempt to get ahead without God. But sooner or later, you're going to realize that you've not gotten very far. Because a life with God is a life that is well blessed beyond measure. A life with God is a life that you don't deserve. But by the grace and mercy of God, you're able to have. You see, I don't make a lot of money, but I live well. Because my God that I serve, that's faithful. He provides what I don't deserve. That's why I'm sold out. That's why I live the life that I live. And you can have it too. Mm. Hallelujah. Let's give them a hand clap of praise. God, you are good. Lord, you are able to save. <clears throat> you see, some decisions are minor. They're temporal. Furniture, cars, 
houses. Yeah, those are big decisions. But the Bible says that the earth shall pass away. Earthly things are very temporal. And a lot of times we get caught up in material items of, I need to have this to look good. I need to have this to feel successful. I need to have this. And there's a checklist of items that you go down. But the Bible says that praise will go on throughout eternity. So when you begin to praise God above what you desire, put it above what you think you need. You put that praise above that. What you're doing is you are investing in a life that is eternal with a God that will never die in a city that will never grow dark where there is going to be immense bliss forever. Forever. Praise will continue forever. When you live a consecrated life, that means you, you have a life that every aspect of your life is dedicated to the praise and the glorifying of our God. Right. Having a life that praises God is going to cost you something though. It's not free. And believe me, when I stand up here today, I can tell you that the price is rather steep. And there will be pain and there will be sorrow. The Bible doesn't say that we're excused from all of this life and what it has to offer. But it does say that he's come to give it to us with greater comfort than those who don't have God. He's come to give it to us more abundantly. But I can tell you right now that there has been life situations and circumstances that I know that I would not have made it through had it not been for me valuing my relationship with God. It's going to cost you something. There will be a price paid this life that I'm talking about, but it's the best life you can ever have. I said it's the best life that you can ever choose. It's the life of serving God. It is the most incredible life that you can ever choose. The end result, even though the price is not cheap, the end result is eternal life. In Mark 8, it says, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the world and lose his own soul? Or the question is, is what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What is your exchange rate this morning? It has to do with where you value yourself and understanding where God values you has to do with where you see yourself but more greatly or more exceeding beyond that is where God sees you but it all comes into play because the question is is do you value yourself great enough to sustain your relationship with God in the bad and the good do you value your, your relationship with God great enough to see yourself through the storm with the help of God? What would you exchange your soul for today? What is your price that you're willing to sell out for? What is the price tag on your soul? You see, if you're not for sale, then you might as well take yourself out of the display. You might as well stop flirting with the world. You might as well put away childish things and make up your mind today that I'm not for sale. You make a definitive conclusion to stop flirting with the world if you're not for sale. Conversely, if you are for sale, then you need to ask yourself the question, what is my price and is it worth it? You see, we can take several Bible illustrations here. We take a, a man by the name of Esau, a man's man, a man of hunting and of the woods who was manly and strong. And he finds himself in a situation where he values the bowl of soup greater than his birthright. He places a value on the now greater than the later or eternity. 
I don't know if you're catching what I'm putting down here, but let me just break it down. When you value what you were, where you're at now and what you are now, you're selling out everything that's to come that God has promised you. All the blessings, all the peace of mind, everything, including your lineage, including your family, it, you're selling it all out for the now for the temporal for the what I need now or what I want now this is what I need and what I wanted and I gotta have it even though it's not right and I don't feel like it's God's will I gotta have it the key word is I that's the word that needs to be taken out of the equation and say God I want what you have for me because it is only what you have that is going to supply me with what I'm gonna be and what I'm gonna have you see, the devil comes by every day. He comes knocking on your door. And it doesn't matter how spiritual you are. In fact, the more spiritual you are, the bigger the target gets. You become a trophy, a potential trophy for hell. But the devil comes by every day and he's knocking and saying, what's your price today? Because he knows day after day we're driven by emotion and one day our value may be great and the next day we're wallowing in our mud and we've made bad decisions and he's knocking on your door and he's saying, what's your price today and are you willing to accept this? He played the same game with Judas which for 30 pieces of silver, he decided to sell out the Messiah. He decided to sell out his Savior. The sad thing about it is, is he never got to even spend the money. Didn't get the opportunity. You see, in the devil's kingdom, it's a little different from what God has to offer. God has to offer eternal life something that's everlasting. It's not temporal. But what the devil has to offer is now. He has no future. He has no place for you. He's not gone to prepare a place for you. He has now to offer and he has no promises for tomorrow. He looks at you and says, but don't you want what I have now? And doesn't it look good now? But he never talks to you about where that road ends. Because... It ends. And where it ends, the Bible says, is a place that nobody should have to go. That everybody should be saved. That it is the will of God. It's the mercy of God. Especially those who have been exposed to the truth of the word of God. It's the will of God that your soul might be saved. Don't sell out. If you ask Judas today, I promise you, he would give you a blood-curdling spill about how you should not sell out. He would give you an explanation that would blow your mind of exactly what's going on in his world today. Because let me tell you something, he may have committed suicide, but he's not dead. He's not dead. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. I'm talking to somebody today because I tell you by the anointing of the Holy Ghost that's upon me right now, this word was given for me this morning. I went to bed last night not knowing what I was going to preach. When I woke up this morning, God laid a heavy burden on my heart to tell you the price is not worth it. Don't accept it. Don't entertain it. Don't look at it. Don't even entertain what's going to happen. Don't do it. The price is not worth it. So you need to ask yourself today, what is the price of my praise? What is the price of my praise? And what is the price of my soul? How much do I value God? How much do I value the things of God? How much do I value my soul? Because let me tell you something. That is a myth. It is a complete myth to think that you value God, but don't value the things of God. That is the biggest lie from the pit of hell. Because if you valued God, you'd value his thinking. You'd value what values, what's valued to him. You'd value exactly what he valued. How much do you value your kids and their souls? 
I mean, this is real. We don't come to church just for a spiritual health checkup every week. I don't come here with a shirt and tie and drag my family to church twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday to prayer. I don't do that just because I want to look good in the community and I need to uphold my self-image. I got, no, 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 no. You understand that there's something that I value greater than my sleep, greater than anything else, and that is that I may be in the presence of a living God and that I may be in line with what God values. Values. This is not a patty cake game. This is not something that's just temporal. What I'm laying the groundwork for today is the future of my family. It is the exact same ground that I'm walking on that was laid before me. And it is a foundation that I am so thankful to have. Mm, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Lord, we worship you, God. Is valuing the things of this world worth it? Everyone looks for a good deal, a shortcut. But there's always a price to be paid. There will always be a price paid. Romans 6.23 says, The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you're sold out to God, you take your price tag off. You're no longer for sale. You, start entertain, you stop entertaining offers and opportunities because what you have bought is a treasure that is greater than any other treasure that can be offered. It's you saying, I'm not for sale. I've made up my mind. There's no going back. I, you know, there came a time in my life where I decided that listening to worldly music just wasn't worth it and that I wanted to surround myself and my time with the Word of God, which is a living Word that has promises in it and not words of heartache and, and words that are not uh, strong enough to be stood on. There comes a point in time where you make up your mind that the things of this world, they're of no value in comparison to God and what He has. It's when you're saying, I'm giving my life, I'm giving my words, my praise, my energy, I'm giving literally everything I am and everything I have to God. That's what it comes down to. You can't subject part of who you are and what you have and keep part of what you think you need. God's not looking for that. God's looking for somebody that says, I'm marking out for sale and I'm putting soul because I'm not taking any more offers. I'm not even entertaining it. This world is temporal and it will pass away. It will not be here. What you think you need today, tomorrow, I promise you, you'll look back and you'll think how silly. How silly and how petty that I actually desired that. Oh, I was such a fool. To place my value of that material item or, or sleep or, or whatever. To place the value of that greater than being in the presence of a mighty God. How foolish was I? How foolish. Coming to a close right now. I don't know where Brother Albert is. Okay. You see, God is addicted to praise. He's addicted to praise. He craves it. He desires it. It's not an option for God. You see, the Bible says that if you decide not to praise, that the rocks would cry out in praise. If you decide not to praise, there will be other worshipers and praisers that come to replace you. Never think that you are irreplaceable in the kingdom of God. God will find his man and his woman. He'll find them. And let me say, it is such a privilege to serve God at any level. In fact, the Bible says the greatest amongst us is the servant of all. But let me just say that at any capacity, any opportunity, anything that presents itself to you, never hesitate to use it to the glory and praise of God. 
because he's looking for those who will praise him. He will do whatever it takes to receive it from you. He's not going to let you off the hook easily. He's not going to. He won't. He desires your praise. So the final question that I have for you today is how much will your praise cost you? How much is it going to cost you? If you don't desire to praise, if you lose your desire to live for God, let me just forewarn you. Because God is a God of mercy and God desires your praise so much, He will place something in your life that will cause you to praise. It's going to cause you to cry out. He will make sure that your voice is used in your praise. Now, if you at that point decide otherwise, then that is your final decision. That's your choice. But God is so merciful, so loving, that he will take away whatever it is in your life, whether it be your health, whether it be your job, whether it be your friends, whether it be whatever it is, he's going to make sure that you find yourself in a place or a position to praise. You see, you find somebody whose heart was after God. You find King David in a situation. He had turned cold. He had lost his praise. He found himself in temptation's path found himself in a situation that he was king. I mean, after all, he was lounging and relaxing in absolute luxury. Found himself making a decision that would cost him. It cost him his son. You see, his praise cost him. It cost him. You find somebody like Samson who also found himself in a like situation. It cost him. Jonah, running from God. His praise cost him. It cost him. See, I don't know if I'm even doing this justice, this last point. But you will find yourself in a position of life. Somewhere. And that will be the price of your praise. Because if you refuse to praise now, God will find a way for you to lift up your voice. And let me just say this, that this is a sanctuary. This is a house of mercy and love and grace. No one here is going to point fingers because we've all been there. We've all slipped down that slope and we've all made mistakes and we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But you'll find yourself calling and crying out to God. Because maybe you lost your praise and maybe you've turned cold and maybe your value of who you are and your walk with God, maybe that slipped a couple of notches. And you need to re-evaluate who you are. You need to re-evaluate your walk with God. Because if you fail to, how much is your praise going to cost you? Will it cost you a car accident? Will it cost you your family members? Because at the end of the day, I can tell you that the truest prayer that I've ever uttered in my entire life, the truest desire that I ever have in the enti my entire life, and that is, is God, whatever it takes. When you make that statement this morning and you tell God whatever it takes, you've basically given him a challenge and he'll accept it. What you're saying is you are literally handing over everything of value in your life for a greater value. It's a greater value. It's a privilege to serve God. It's incredible to serve God. 
There's nothing like being in the presence of God. There's nothing worth trading this feeling for right here because I can tell you that I know of many stories and situations where people committed suicide because they could no longer feel the presence of God. They took it for granted and we sit here Sunday and service after service in the midst of a powerful presence of God and we can walk out of here and our value is never ever risen to a place where God would like it to be. And then we fail to praise. But I'm telling you here this morning that God's mercy is such that He will get you into a position where you will praise. And when you look at that position, you look at that situation, you won't despise it when you have the knowledge that I'm imparting to you today, but you will cling to it and you will learn from it and you will walk away with a love and a deeper love for God and a walk with God stronger and deeper than you've ever had if you allow God to work on your heart. Let's all stand today. Matthew 13, 44 through 46, and I'll close with this scripture. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl, of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it all that he had I ask you again today where's your treasure where does your treasure lie where is your heart and how much are you willing to pay for the field are you willing to pay all for this because that's what he's looking for He's looking for the praise from those who are willing to pay everything that they have. Amen. I'm opening up these altars this morning. If you want to recommit yourself to God, if you feel God tugging on your heart today and you're willing to come up here and say, God, I'm wanting what you have and I'm willing to give all that I have.